right, ladies and gentlemen, I, in the interest of time, I think it's time for us to begin. We're half, half a minute ahead of schedule, uh, but I will uh, gradually start because we have a huge agenda uh, for today. It's a huge pleasure for me to be here. Uh, my name is Maria Snigalaya. I'm a senior fellow for Europe, Russia, Russia and Eurasia with Center for International Security Studies, as well as um, a fellow with the Liberalism Studies program here at the George Washington and postdoc at Georgetown. Uh, but most importantly, today we are very honored to have our dear colleague, uh, Professor Kas Madi, uh, who is absolutely probably the number one uh, name in uh, studies of populism today, talk about the forthcoming 2024 European Parliament election. Uh, so, the uh, prof Professor Kas Madi, who prefers to be uh, called, as we know now, as School of Politics <laughs> has uh, was was born in the Netherlands, where he gained his um, PhD in political science, science in Leiden University under the supervision of the late Peter Mayer. Before moving to the United States in 2008, uh, to, he held new track positions at Central European University, the University of Edinburgh, the University of Antwerp, and before coming to the University of Georgia in 2012, he held temporary positions at the University of Oregon. Notre Dame and Depot University. He also held multiple visiting positions in uh, various European universities. Most importantly, Professor Kasmari is absolutely top name in studies of populism. I just estimated that in my book, which doesn't even focus primarily on populism, I cite at least five or six of his publications, and I think every single school of populism these days certainly have uh, at least cited the ideational definition of populism, uh, if not all the other um, related work. Uh, but today, our conversation focuses on the forthcoming parliamentary election. As I mentioned, why is it interesting? Well, uh, first of all, it's the 10th parliamentary election since the first direct elections in the European Parliament in 1979, and also the first one since Brexit. Since Brexit. If that was not enough uh, to spice uh, uh, your interest, uh, the election, according to Guardian in Politico, is expected to be the one of the more contentious elections in the history of the European Parliament, primarily because of the rise of the far right. So how is this going to unravel in the world which is already quite turbulent in light of the war in Ukraine and in light, of course, of the, all these other processes ongoing in our democracies. This is what we're hoping the professor will tell us today. Okay, let's see what I can. So what I will do is I will talk first shortly about what the European elections are and why they are not really European elections. Then I will talk about the campaign for the upcoming elections, which really, again, is actually not a campaign. We'll talk about the results, as in the predicted results, which are actually relatively stable across various polls. Um, I don't necessarily expect very big uh, shifts. We'll talk about the political consequences of it, which is really what it is all about. What will it do for European policies and for European integration as such? And then we'll talk shortly about the elephant in the room. So European elections are not actually European elections in the sense that the only thing that the elections have in common is that they're for the same institution, the European Parliament. But technically, there are 27 national elections in the sense that every election, national election has its own campaign, it has its own parties, and it has its own electoral rules. And it's a, very important is the parties part. There really is one, maybe two parties that are campaigning in more than one country. One is Volt, which is a, a very pro-European party. And then, uh, if they still exist, DM25, um, <coughs> which uh, is a vanity 
project of a former Minister of Finance of Greece. Um, but for the rest, it is pretty much the national parties that contest, even though they contest with European leaders. Um, and as said, the elections are held across three days, uh, four, six to nine, um, but with different electoral rules. In most countries, these are the same rules as the national parliamentary elections, but in certain countries, that's different. Most notably, France and Germany, actually, because Germany doesn't have an electoral threshold. That's very relevant, because Germany has the most seats, which roughly means that 1% is one seat. And so the Germans have a national threshold of 5%. And in the European election, you see a lot of parties that we never really see in national politics that can get into the European Parliament, get at least a couple of people employed, have some money um, out of that. Now, in the political science literature, European elections are seen as second order elections. And the whole concept of the second order election is based on the literature on US midterm elections. And the main idea of second order elections is that they're less important. And so first order elections are about national power. Second order elections are all other elections. So that includes local elections, subnational elections, but also supranational elections. So the idea is that they're less important to voters. And the consequences are then that government parties are expected to lose. Extreme or small parties are expected to win, and turnout is expected to be low. Now, second order election theory is taking a bit of a hit because of changing circumstances. Particularly among the more Europhile, my more Europhile colleagues, they argue that second order elections don't hold anymore because Europe has become important. That is a thesis that holds mostly among people who are pro-European or who study Europe. Fact of the matter is, Europe is not important to most people. But it's particularly this part that is becoming more problematic. So the thesis initially argued that extreme parties would win because people would use the election to vote with the boot. <coughs> Um, as we do in U.S. midterm elections, the idea is that during the midterm, if you're unhappy with the national government, you vote for the other party. Now, if you're unhappy in a complex multi-party system, you do that by voting for the one who is against everyone. Traditionally, that is the far right. The problem is that the theory was written in the 1980s, and extreme and small overlapped. It's the idea that small parties, that extreme parties were small, but also that extreme right was considered to be extreme. Today, we live in a different world. First of all, far-right parties are no longer small. In seven out of the 27 EU member states, the far-right is the biggest party. In probably half of them, they're among the top two free. Importantly, for a sizable portion of the population, far-right parties are not seen as outside of the political mainstream. Because technically, they are not. They're involved in coalitions at the national level or subnational level in more than half of the EU member states. And they're now in governments, which means that these start to overlap. Right? If government parties will lose, then that means that, for example, Fidesz, which is in government in Hungary, would lose, despite being an extreme party. So the effects are, for a variety of reasons, while second order election might still hold, the effect at the aggregate level is actually generally not big. And the reasons is this again. Right? So the US midterms, it's a midterm everywhere. Right? Because it's the same national cycle. So it doesn't matter whether you hold 
midterm elections in Georgia or in Virginia, they're held at the midterm of the national cycle of presidential elections. <clears throat> in the EU, you have 27 different national cycles. And so while it might be midterm or close to midterm in a country like France, it's just a couple of months for the Netherlands. And so if you take all of that together, and actually it depends on where in the national cycle you hold elections, it kind of is a wash. And so empirically we find that far-right parties do not necessarily do better in European elections. They do better in European elections that are midterm. So the campaign. And I put that in inverted commas because if you are European and you will look back at your national newspapers at the moment, you will probably find almost nothing. In fact, if you have, like me, you subscribe to the newsletter of Politico Europe, one of the few outlets that is obsessed with the EU, even they can barely find something to write about with regard to the campaign. There is no campaign in any of the member states. Now, of course, European campaigns are not as long as, as US campaigns, but we're less than two months away, <coughs> uh, a bit over. Like, this is insane. Like, these are very important elections on all levels, and we have pretty much no talk about it yet. As said, the campaigns are going to be national, but really to the extent that when you see European campaigns in, for example, the Netherlands, it's not the European leader of the major parties that discuss, it's the national leaders who will mostly talk about national issues and many people vote about national issues and vote in particularly for or against the government. There are a couple of issues that we can expect to dominate and they have to do as almost always with this group, which is the European People's Party. It is what is often called the center-right group. I think we can be very clear about that. It is a right-wing group. <clears throat> it's not very centrist. It is Traditionally, the Christian Democrats, it is by far the largest political group in the European Parliament. And for a variety of reasons, they tend to set the tone if any tone is being set. They have chosen to make these elections about three issues, the third one being added more recently. Immigration, where they argue that they have solved it, which is awesome because a lot of people are concerned about it. <clears throat> but they think they have solved it by making, pretty much by paying off dictators in North Africa so that they keep immigrants from coming to Europe. But they've done that with Tunisia. They now just pay allegedly 7.2 billion to Sisi in Egypt. And how they try to campaign is by saying, look, the far right is all the time shouting about immigration, but we are the ones who solve it. And the important point there is that in that discourse, implicitly is the far right is right on the issue. Immigration is a big problem. It is a big threat. This is just a matter of competence. We are competent. We solve it. Right? The second issue is the European Green Deal, which is pretty much already being killed by von der Leyen, <clears throat> but the EPP is running, particularly in the wake of farmer protests across a couple of countries in Europe, in just undermining the Green Deal. Again, taking on board, copying the framing of the far right, namely that this is an inflated problem, that the measures are mostly at the expense of the people, the common people, whereas the big business stays out of it. These two issues, the EPP hopes will help their parties, but it will definitely help the far right because it's their phrase. The third one is a bit new. The EPP wants to make defense 
in light of Ukraine, a key issue. They want to have a commissioner for defense. <clears throat> they want to create a European defense, although they're very vague on how that exactly should look. That is actually potentially an issue that is problematic for the far right. Because A, it's not their competence, um, and B, they're divided on it. Um, but it's not being pushed, and probably, <clears throat> while I personally believe that this should have been, that the European elections of 2024 are the perfect moment to actually discuss this core issue for Europe, um, <clears throat> it will probably not play that much of a role. Now here is a recent poll that asks people in a variety of EU member states what do you think is the most important or change the way you think, which would assume is the most important. And the key thing that you see is two. First of all, it's very divided. In different countries, people find different points. But more importantly, we're talking about pluralities. Right? And so there is this discourse that the people, because the people are always homogenous, are concerned about immigration. They are concerned about specific things. But the people, A, don't exist. <clears throat> but there is not one majority block that is primarily concerned with one issue. Now, European politics is also problematic <clears throat> because while there are national parties that contest the elections, in the European Parliament, political parties don't sit together on the basis of their, na their nation, but on the basis of Euro parties. And Euro parties are kind of constructed on the basis of a shared ideology. But it's a bit more than that. While they have ideological affinities, there's also often an opportunistic element. So every major group wants to have at least one relevant party from a bigger member state, because that brings a lot of seats. And that means that generally, <clears throat> the ideological connection is a bit less important. Take Forza Italia, Berlusconi's party in no way a traditional Christian democratic party. Like, it was always a right-wing populist party, but Italy is one of the biggest EU member states. If you can take the member, <coughs> a, a member party that is the biggest of that, you bring a massive number of seats to your group, which means that you have more power in the European Parliament. Now today, we have <coughs> the current constellation European People's Party, I talked about it. It's a right-wing um, conglomerate. It's the biggest one. It's also represented in every single member state, the only one. Um, <clears throat> traditionally more Christian democratic, but it also has some conservative parties. SND are the Social Democrats. Again, that concept is stretchable, um, particularly in Central and Eastern Europe. It traditionally has a party like Smer from Slovakia in it, which sits at the boundaries of the far right. Renew Europe is a complete mess. The political Europe had a phenomenal uh, um, description of them. It actually has three different top candidates for this election. Um, that's mostly related to the massive ego of uh, Macron, um, which has its own group within the traditional European liberals, but also because actually the liberal group has always been divided. You have the so-called social liberals and the conservative liberals. And I'm from the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, we have that very clear between the VVD, which are the conservative party, and D66, which is more a libertarian party. They're both part of Renew Europe. Um, they also govern very often, but social culturally, they're almost opposite. ID is the group that we generally see as the far-right group. It's the group of Matteo Salvini, of Marine Le Pen. Um, <clears throat> but the ECR <clears throat> is the group that is often still called conservative, because it was founded by the Conservative Party in Britain. These days, 
it is dominated by law and justice in Poland and the Brothers of Italy in Italy. So ECR is actually a far-right group <coughs> with a couple conservatives left, but predominantly ODF in the Czech Republic. Greens EFA is a bit of a weird combination as well. It is the Greens, and Green is also a concept that is pretty broad if you take it to Central and Eastern Europe, um, <clears throat> as well as some more regionalist parties. And then we have the so-called radical left, which actually also has some Nordic Greens in it, um, relatively small, and you see that these <clears throat> generally have far fewer representatives and in fewer countries. And then finally, what is called the non-inscripts, which are the ones who are not part of any group. The biggest one <clears throat> is um, <clears throat> in Italy, and that one in Hungary should have it. This is all one probably. So Fides is at the moment in the non-inscript. <clears throat> so this is the dis distribution of the current parliament. And the 2019 elections were already dominated about the debate that the far right was going to win. Importantly, the 2014 elections were also um, with that same thing. But what was important in 2019 was that the so-called center-right and the center-left groups, EPP and SND, lost their majority for the first time <coughs> um, since we had elected MEPs. Um, and so the center could only hold on to its power by working together with the liberal group. And that was a shift. There is a big Brexit effect. The Brexit effect had two particular effects. SND was affected because labor, which was traditionally a large portion, though not that large in 2019, left. The biggest effect was really on the ECR. As I said, the ECR, the European Conservatives and Reformists, were founded by the Tories. And they were pretty much controlled by the Tories until Brexit became clear. After that, the biggest group was Law and Justice, the Polish party. The Law and Justice is a fairly parochial party which doesn't think much about Europe. And its politicians in Brussels were not overly skilled, <clears throat> which probably explains why at the moment it's actually Brothers of Italy which rules that group. And they are much smarter, particularly Georgia Middle. So the far right did win in 2019, but it also remained divided. You could say that ECR and ID are both far right with one or two parties that are exceptions. Together, they would be the third biggest group in the outgoing parliament, right? and a major player. But they're not. And as a consequence, they have actually been pretty irrelevant in the last legislature. And then there was the Fidesz-EPP break. Fidesz was a long time already kind of the black sheep in the EPP, but Fidesz delivered in votes whatever they did back in Hungary, mostly destroying democracy. <clears throat> in Europe, in Brussels, they always voted loyally with the EPP up until the so-called refugee crisis of 2015-16. Then <clears throat> Orban became ambitious and wanted to become a European player. That created a lot of tension the EPP is traditionally dominated by the Christian Democrats from Germany. <clears throat> and in the end, Fidesz broke, uh, broke off, but they would have been kicked out. <clears throat> and Fidesz is the hot prize for the right, not only because they win about 50% of the seats. Now, Hungary is a small state, but winning 50% is quite a lot of seats. But also, very importantly, <coughs> It's one seat in the European Council. The European Council is the most powerful body of the European Union, and that is <clears throat> where the leaders of the different countries come together. Orban is guaranteed, right? And so, IND, Le Pen, 
and they got have already, like they have been courting British Orban since 2015. But surprisingly, ECR has now also said that they're open to Orban. Orban claims that he is going to join ECR. <coughs> that could make a lot of difference, <coughs> but I will talk about that a bit more. So here you see the projected seats, and actually, I like often these kind of things, not only because of the pretty colors, <coughs> but because purely visually, what you will see is not a sea change. Like, so yes, the far right wins, and actually the non script is bigger as well. That is because there are a lot of new parties that are going to get re-elected. They haven't chosen a group yet. Several of them will probably choose a far right group. But what is important is there is not a major shift. And the reason is simple. The far right already won in 2019 and 2014. <clears throat> but there is a symbolic, a potentially symbolic shift. And the symbolic shift is that there is a chance that the mainstream right, together with the far right, will have a majority in the European Parliament. That doesn't mean that this heart, the centrist heart of social democrats, liberals, and Christian democrats don't have a majority. They also have a majority. But there is now an alternative. And I think that is crucial. So what are the political consequences? To a large extent, we will only know that a couple of months after the elections. Not because Europeans have to count ballots like Americans for weeks at an end but because of group formation. What all the predictions are based on the current groups and the current group memberships. There has been for a long time speculation that ECR and IND will go together. They were relatively close, but then Putin re-invaded uh, Ukraine. And that was a major stumbling block between particularly Orban, who is always in the background, um, and Kaczynski, Fidesz and PIS. However, it looks like the ECR is going to be the kingmaker. European conservatives and reformists, you I always have to think Maloney here. Right? The, the EPP has been courting Maloney like crazy for months which has a lot to do with the fact that its member, the EPP member in Italy, is governing with Maloney. That's the Forza Italia party. <clears throat> and it has to do with the fact that the brothers of Italy are by far the largest party in Italy. Forza Italia is done for now that Berlusconi is dead. And so the EPP is trying to find like, a major player in a major country. Now, how do you do that? Most foremost, by acting as if Maloney is actually not far right, but a conservative. And this is going really well. Like I was in Europe last summer, and I got massive pushback from various journalists for calling Georgia Maloney, who has lived her whole life in a fascist subculture. A fascist, well, not a far right, a truly fascist subculture, calling her far right. right? Every time journalists tell me, but she doesn't do anything radical because she supports Ukraine, which has now become the proxy for being liberal democratic. <clears throat> but I think where the real power lives is here, in the right wing of the EPP. The EPP is a very large group. It even has still some Christian Democrats in it. They just come from very irrelevant countries like Luxembourg <laughs> and the Netherlands. <clears throat> um, it has a very strong right wing. Parties that have been governing with the far right at the national level for a long time. Think about the ÖVP in Austria. <clears throat> what the EPP right wing will do is whenever they want something and the centrist coalition doesn't want that, they will start to play with an alternative and say, look, if you don't support a more right wing version, then we will go with ECR and ID, and we'll do something 
much more right-wing than that. So it is particularly the right wing of the EPP that is now in the center, that has the two different options. Now, where does that leave, where does that leave us? Pretty bad on the immigration and the European Green Deal. To be fair, immigration policy in Europe cannot get much worse. Um, over the last two decades, it has only been about strictening. Of course, with all kinds of problems, Frontex is becoming of this massive organization. We're buying off safe third uh, countries all over the place, including the very safe Libya, which doesn't actually have a national government. This is what we're going to get. I, I mean, there is, because there's a vast majority in the parliament that will support these type of deals with dubious countries to keep immigrants from coming into the EU. We're also going to see uh, an undermining of the European Green Deal, particularly catering to the interest of farmers, which quite often is agribusiness, um, which is a very important distinction um, to be made. I, I personally don't think that there will be a lot of change on Ukraine or European defense. The reason is simple, and I can talk more about that later. The far right is actually a bit uh, divided on this issue. <coughs> EU reform is going to be problematic. And so, again, because we don't have a campaign, we don't talk about this, but actually the EU is very close to being unworkable, particularly if it enlarges further. And there's a massive pressure to enlarge at least into the Western Balkans. Um, <coughs> That, without reforming the institutions, means that they by and large can't decide on anything with current vetoes and other things. EU reform is virtually impossible with the far right. Um, EU enlargement, again, possible because they're divided. Particularly Orban is very much in favor um, of the Western Balkans joining because he has several friends. <coughs> now, the elephant in the room. This is kind of the person that no one in Europe wants to talk about, particularly <clears throat> when you're involved in planning. But this bank could come back. I put it at 50-50, and in my more manic periods, I think it's only 40% chance. <clears throat> but it could happen. The problem, <laughs> I, I, I can go on and on about the problems of that, but from the perspective of the EU, one of the major problems is that if Trump comes back, he will pull the US away from pretty much world politics in general, European affairs, <clears throat> and of course, Russia and Ukraine, but way beyond that. And whether we like it or not, the EU <clears throat> has been free riding on the US for decades. Right? <clears throat> The US has provided the military security. <clears throat> the European countries have, and in that Trump was right, been mostly under the 2% norm of 2% of the national budget spending on uh, defense. Even today, after the push from Trump, it's uh, about half of the, EU of the EU NATO member states are above 2% and barely. Right. Now, so what does that mean? It means that the EU will have to do far more than it has ever done in its existence. In no time, because there's no time to waste on Ukraine. There's no time to waste on various other issues. And it will have to do this at a time that the European Parliament is more divided than it's ever been. It's that combination that is dramatic. That doesn't mean that if Biden gets reelected, there isn't an issue either. Even though Biden is a committed transatlanticist, because he's very old, he doesn't reflect in any way his party, or the American people for that matter. Right? <clears throat> for, very, for obvious reasons, economic, military, and culturally, the US is moving away from Europe. And that also means that Europe will have to create some type of military. 
it will have to create some type of foreign policy, which is, is dramatic. Yeah? Just think about the Middle East and Gaza, for example. The only difference between the two is how fast and how extreme. Right? If Biden, you get four more years in which you can do it. Now, don't forget that Trump was pretty clear on where he stood on the UN NATO before he got elected. So we're now almost eight years since that. And if you look at what the EU has been doing, it hasn't been impressive. <clears throat> so four years is not as much as we think. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor. Fantastic uh, and very clear presentation that certainly um, I think is going to be in some ways, but also things are not as horrible as one could have imagined from the news um, uh, headlines. Having said that, I'm going to use the opportunity of the moderator to ask you a couple of questions, uh, and I ask our audience to please think about the questions you want to ask subsequently. We do not have a lot of time, uh, so I will proceed. So the first question, uh, I'm going to put my comparativist uh, hat first and ask you about what uh, does this domination of right, right, as you mentioned, is not just far right, but more like conservative right, means going forward for anti-democratic uh, in, in infringement, uh, the certain tendencies that we've seen certainly in Hungary, in Poland, elsewhere. Does it potentially mean that we will have this more anti-democratic leaning or will it just means that mean that, as you said, immigration on other maybe certain protectionist economic policies will have a priority? I also want to mention to mention that uh, Max, Maximilian Kra, leading uh, MEP for AFD, uh, he actually pointed out that this election may see the breakout of the cordon sanitaire, meaning that finally the far right will be accepted uh, by the European mainstream and finally will be collaborating with them. I wanted you to comment on that. It's ironic that it comes from an AFD person because um, <coughs> Lega and I need just had a meeting. Do you need that? Um, they had a meeting in Italy um, in, in the run-up to the uh, European elections and AFD was not invited. Um, and so AFD is actually currently facing a cordon sanitaire of the far right in Europe. Um, I mean, for all purposes, there is no far right uh, cordon sanitaire anymore. Mm. Germany has one, Belgium has one, France has one, and that's about it. Um, the German one is crumbling, and we'll see whether it will survive the free state elections uh, in the fall, which are all in uh, East German states, at least in two, AFD is going to be the first one. The coalitions without it are going to be incredibly hard. Um, it's crumbling in uh, Flanders, the Dutch-speaking part of Belgium. In fact, for the last months, polls are predicting uh, a majority for the far-right Vlaams Belang, together with what can only be called uh, far-right light, um, NVA. Um, <clears throat> and in France will hold its cordon sanitaire until Marine Le Pen will become president, right? And so it's like the cordon sanitaire around ideas is we're, we're 10, 15 years uh, beyond that. Um, politically, the cordon sanitaire doesn't exist technically in the European Parliament either. It exists for the ID. It doesn't exist for ECR. Um, but what is much more interesting there is actually the, the shift in discourse. And that's exactly about terminology. Right? And so ECR is still seen as conservative. That justifies governing with them, collaborating with them. ID is far right. And so we exclude those. I think we see more illiberal democracy, which is not something limited to the far right. Um, I, uh, a lot of liberal protections of democracy have been um, <clears throat> challenged since 9-11. Authoritarian policies that invade our privacy um, have done dubious things for rule of law, particularly for non-citizens. Um, but I, 
surveillancing, uh, securitization of all kinds of things are going strong. <coughs> the far right is not necessary for that legislation. Most of the time this comes from mainstream right is happily supported deep into sometimes even greens. Um, I think what we can expect is even less EU actions against illiberal democracies within the EU. So <clears throat> there are a couple of reasons for that. Of course, this was always a weakness. That's the reason why Orban could survive. Cynically said, I would say in the first decades, the EU found neoliberalism more important, the first two decades of the 21st century. The EU found neoliberalism more important than liberal democracy. And as long as um, Orban opened up the market, he was good. Then when he started to create his national bourgeoisie and started to nationalize banks and media through his cronies, there was a massive pushback. Then he was kicked out of EPP. He didn't have that protection anymore. Right? But now you see, as I cynically remarked earlier, that the new like, touchstone of democracy is whether or not you support Ukraine. And because Poland supported Ukraine, or at least was very anti-Russian, uh, there was massive support for them to get some of the funds that had been postponed, <clears throat> as well as a normalization. Um, authoritarian leaders learn. Right? And, and they don't only learn by copying what Orban does. They also look at how the rest responds to Orban. And so, for example, Jansha in Slovenia, who is in many ways a little <coughs> mini-me of Orban, directly went pro-Ukraine. Because he knows if I'm there, I can do all kinds of other stuff. Meloni learned the lesson very well is very strongly pro-Ukraine and gets virtually no pushback on going after LGBTQI people, for example, as well as trying to bring more and more power into the executive. So um, this is, again, not so much the far right that does it. This is the rest that tolerates it. And as long as Ukraine is so central, I think that will stay. The key question, and that's the whole reason why, in the end, <clears throat> Orban is going to choose ECR rather than ID. Orban lost his veto. Law and justice was his veto in the European Council. Any sanction against Hungary would be vetoed by PIS, even despite the, the difference of opinion on it. Because PIS always fought we will be next. At the moment, there's only one thing that he needs. That's someone to provide that veto. And that someone is Maloney. That is his best bet. <clears throat> and that's why he wants to be in ECR. Um, and I think it will happen. And I expect after this election that there will be even less sanctions or even talk about illiberal democracy being created within the EU. Um, because that is at the core of the ECR agenda. It's less on the core of the ID agenda because they don't have the same control, but they of course don't have the same idea. For them, Hungary is a flourishing democracy. Thank you, uh, certainly concerning. So I'm gonna open up for the public. Uh, would you mind please uh, introducing yourself first uh, before you start asking the question, sir? Uh, oh, sorry. Um, I, I was watching something a few weeks ago after the... Um, a reminder to introduce yourself first. What's that? Introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Rick Davis. I'm alone. Um, I was watching this show about the Netherlands elections, and one of the things they were saying is that people were voting for the far right because of very practical concerns, like high price of housing, uh, things like that. And I was wondering, do you see those kind of meat and potato issues as influencing these European elections? Excellent. Any other questions, maybe? I'll take, I would like to take a couple. Um, yes, sir. 
Oh, actually, let, let's, let's get that one question. My apologies. Hi, my name is Caroline. I'm a student here at Elliott. Um, and my question is, in the United States, we've seen a rise of young people engaged in the far right and the conservative spheres. In these elections that are coming up, are we seeing the rise in far right popularity happening among sort of the older generations or more of the new sort of generation of voters? Great question, and maybe one more. Uh, yeah, uh, my name is Dominikas Kaminskas. I'm uh, from Vilnius University. Um, I, would, I would like to ask uh, you about the yeah, definition of the right. We, uh, I mean, uh, you already started talking about it, but uh, what do we actually mean when we say far right? Uh, because I feel like you know we're talking about how it homogenizes the people, but we are sort of doing the same because uh, I mean, when we look at Orban, that's that's one thing. When we look at uh, this, uh, I mean, in, in Poland, it's probably similar, but then. There are variations there as well, and uh, and I think the the it paints a very complicated picture for this uh, for this election. So, like even if we're talking about migration and the topics that is uh, that they these uh, far right uh, you know parties they, they put forward, uh, even the arguments against migration they come from different backgrounds and even sometimes seem for me to come from like a leftist part of of, of, of the discourse. So, like um, how do we know? How do we decide? Uh, you know, which, which ones do we need to fight against, basically? Thank you. Okay, so the first, the first question ties to uh, something Maria and I discussed over lunch, which is disinformation and misinformation, and how that um, doesn't just come from the sources that we don't like, as in social media or right-wing sources. There's a massive amount of misinformation in so-called legacy media, and particularly about the far right. So <clears throat> there is something inherent, it seems, in centrists that they cannot accept that large groups of the population vote for the far right because they're against immigrants. They, they just can't seem to cope with that, even though we have four decades of research showing that. Every single time including Trump, every single time centrists will argue that it really is about other concerns because it can be the fact that actually people are xenophobic. People are xenophobic, have always been. They're actually less xenophobic today than they used to be. Um, we've had a very clear study of why people voted for the PVV, Geert Wilders' party. Immigration, 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 immigration. I ask any of their voters, they're very clear about it. As far as they talk about housing, it's housing being taken away by asylum seekers. That was the whole housing debate in the Netherlands. In terms of like <clears throat> purchasing power, all debate was purchasing power gone down because of immigration. Right? So, the far-right vote has always been, at least in Western Europe and in North America, about immigration, about multiculturalism, about dissatisfaction with that. This election was absolutely no different, and it's very clear. Are there other frustrations? Sure. Most of them only lead to far-right voting if you can link them to immigration. And so even our so-called agrarian populist party, which is ironic in a party that has the highest density <clears throat> after Bangladesh in the world, we virtually have no rural areas left in the Netherlands. Like that party, a lot of it was the farms are being pushed away under the argument of climate change, but really to make space for asylum seekers. Right? Is that everything comes back. I'm not saying that people are not also concerned about economic issues, but if you can't translate those through social cultural means, which normally means immigration, then the far right doesn't, doesn't um, succeed. The youth and the far right is much more difficult. So first of all, yes, we see a lot of youth being active here in the US in part because we have opened up the concept of far right. Many of these groups 
we would probably have called conservative 10 years ago. Now, some people might say, yeah, they're still conservative today. I will say they were far right 10 years ago. Um, the so-called old right, which was a highly problematic term, right, was clearly a more youth phenomenon. You do see a movement like Turning Point USA, for example, which is a very large movement um, <clears throat> and very clearly far right. Uh, that being said, the Republican Party is not the party of the youth. Um, and you see particularly not only in voting, but you see particularly in values that the youth is more inclusive across the board significantly right? on issues like gender equality, on issues as ethnic racial diversity, on issues like LGBTQI, uh, which is pretty much generational replacement explains why societies have actually become slightly more progressive, despite politics becoming much more reactionary, if you want. So that, that in Europe, it depends. Um, there are certain parties that do very well among the youth. The Rassemblement National of Marine Le Pen, for example. Um, at the same time, you saw, for example, Brexit being primarily driven by older people. It's difficult to say why. I have some ideas about it. I think, first of all, for young people, there's nothing radical about the radical right. They, they, became, they were socialized at a time that the whole ma mainstream already had adopted most of the frames of the far right. For them, the, if, you, if you think about the difference between the ÖVP in Austria and the FPÖ today, right, you don't see a sea change. You don't know where that border is. Right? In the 1980s, it was very clear. Like the difference between Les Républicains and Rassemblement National to, today, I mean, it's, it's virtually impossible. If you see Jean-Marie Le Pen versus Nicolas Sarkozy debating, you see a very clear change. So young people think back three, four years. Right? That's the process in which they became socialized. So for them, this is not radical. This is just one of the parties. Second, for most young people in Europe, the system doesn't work very well. Um, their future, they're going to be less well off than their parents were. Uh, the welfare state is not going to exist in the same way as they're now paying for. All kind of other things. Right? So they look beyond that. They also look differently at parties. They don't look at the social democrats as the party that build up the welfare state as my generation does, they think about the parties that supported austerity. <clears throat> um, and then there are linked to that closed economic systems. And so France is a very good example. France is a fairly closed economic system where those who are part of it have protections that young people will never have. Um, and so for them, blowing up the system is not necessarily negative means something else. Um, still, you can't say that the youth is the future for the far right. I mean, the, both in terms of values and voting behavior, it really depends on the country. Now, far right, <clears throat> I can talk forever about definitions, but you don't want to hear that. The key point are two elements to that. First is right, the other one is far. Both are problematic, but every term is problematic. In, in politics, particularly once a term, an academic term is used broadly in a public debate, you have a problem. So I don't use right in the, in the more common 20th century term of market versus state. In fact, I fall back on uh, Italian political philosopher, Norberto Bobbio, who has kind of a meta definition. And, and largely, simply stated, for right wing forces, inequalities in society are natural, and they should stay that way. It's not up to the state to take care of them. In that sense, like nativism, for example, like is right-wing. 
economic policies are secondary to the far right. And what you see is even if they support left-wing policies, there's always an element of inequality in it. So what we call welfare chauvinism, a support for the welfare state, but only or primarily for your own people. Right? The core value is still based on inequality, not equality. Now the question then is, what is far right? So for me, the far right is a combination of extreme right and radical right. The extreme is fundamentally anti-democratic, which means that they don't believe in popular sovereignty and majority rule. The radical accepts that people elect their own leaders, but they have problems with liberal democracy, particularly with rule of law and minority rights. Now you could say, why then not just talk about radical extreme right? I actually used to speak almost exclusively about the radical right, specifically populist radical right. I think it's problematic these days because there are more and more parties that are at the boundary of radical and extreme, where they often sound as if they're pro-democratic, but in actions, they're not. Orban is a very good example. But the Republican Party is also a very good example. The Republican Party in action, as well as in words, by denying the results of the best organized presidential elections in US history, right, is a fundamentally anti-democratic position. Um, voter intimidation <clears throat> and exclusion, repression, as we see in my state and in various other GOP-controlled states, is fundamentally anti-democratic, not liberal democratic, democratic. It goes against one person, one vote. It goes against majority rule. <clears throat> um, but they're not Nazis, right? They don't say that they're anti-democratic. And that makes it often very difficult, right? And that makes it also almost impossible to debate. Like, if I have an imaginary debate with a Nazi, that, that Nazi is not going to try and convince me that they are actually the democratic one, right? But a Trumper is, right? Because they are going to say, no, we're doing this actually to save democracy. Um, and so we now have parties that are in action anti-democratic, but in word anti-liberal democratic. And so I think certain parties deserve the term far right, and as a category, right, for me, for example, Fides cannot be just called radical right. Um, the big problem these days is actually the other boundary. Where does conservatism end and the radical right start? Now, that's difficult because, well, everyone talks about, well, the far right is an unclear term or populism is an unclear term. Conservatism, now that is an unclear term. Right? We have virtually no decent definition of conservatism, and most are either European-defined or American-defined, and they are almost opposites. Like what European conservatism is traditionally highly sus sus uh, suspected of the market, the free market, whereas the free market is the essence of conservatism in the U.S. context. Heritage Foundation is a very good example. For a very long time, the Heritage Foundation was the standard bearer of U.S. conservatism. Recently, Kevin Roberts, who is the president of the Heritage Foundation, wrote a blog post where he said, wrote, what is conservatism? It was a, a virtually a literal definition of the far right. Um, and so I don't know where that boundary is anymore, but that's not a problem of, con of concepts. It's a problem of wandering parties. Where is the Conservative Party in Britain? It has some of the most vile transphobic language. It has some of the vilest anti-immigrant uh, language and policies. But it also has the most diverse cabinet in European history. OVP versus FPO. Like, I mean, Rassemblement National. These boundaries are so difficult, right? Um, but what the one thing that we know, it's not because the far right moderate. It's because the mainstream right radical.
That's fantastic. I do see some uh, hands. Do we have a little bit of time? Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. All right, yes, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm Adele Saron. I, uh, I'm a political scientist here. Um, so this is all very interesting. One thing that I'm curious about is the question of, in a way, what should the right wing do? And clearly, it's clear what they have done. They've adopted policies of the far right for a very long time, especially on issues on immigration, um, but also, as you say, on green issues. And the question is, uh, it, because you say people vote for the far right because that's what they think about immigration. And it's pretty clear that they vote for the far right and they don't vote for the right because of that. There is a valence issue and they don't vote. But would, would we be looking at a different situation with a more, I mean, clearly there is a reason why the, the right wing keeps adopting policies of the far right and keeps resembling more and more the far right in policies. And is there another solution would it be different in another way? I mean, we don't deal with counterfactuals, but I do wonder why it's consistently the case that the right, the, the what, what was the center right wing is adopting the far right policies. And there's a question next to Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm a PhD um, at Salzburg, and I'm currently working here. I have a question regarding, um, you mentioned defense and NATO, and um, when we look at the elections this year, I wonder, what are your what is your feeling of the impacts of we in Europe need to finance a war and have to cut social spendings, right? Like the money has to come from somewhere. What is the impact? What do you think will be kind of the impact on voters and resentment and the far right? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Sarah Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Mareike Moral. I work at the Heinrich Böll Foundation, um, but a fellow uh, Dutchie. Um, my question is on the left side of the spectrum, or even just the center left, whether there is any kind of narrative or issues that you think would be even remotely successful in pushing against this far right narrative. So to put, for instance, um, something like Joe Biden did of combining economic populism labor and climate uh, to create some kind of other narrative than just immigration and far-right issues? Yeah, thank you. I'm going to work back. Um, okay, let me, let me directly be a bit provocative. I actually, for Europeans here, not for Americans, I actually think that in many ways Biden is more radical and more left-wing than most European left-wing politicians. I cannot remember a European left-wing politician being so pro-union, for example. Most social democrats don't even dare to talk about unions anymore. Right? He has spoken out, and this is an old dude, right, in favor of transgender rights. Like, I mean, look at how Starmer is struggling to like not speak about it. He embraces multiculturalism, which again, like no one virtually does in the center left. Now, all of this is within all kinds of limits, right? I mean, half of the struggle that Biden fights are to get to a level that the worst European state is at the moment. <clears throat> but in, in terms of inclusion, the debate here is so much more advanced than, than in Europe. That being said, there, there are different lefts. And um, for me, despite the fact that in my own country, Social Democrats and Greens are now together, these are two completely different movements, ideologically, but also in terms of support. Um, Greens have a much more individualistic and libertarian tradition <clears throat> than Social Democrats are much more collectivist. And they have different audiences who are very open to each other. Right? but fundamentally do stand for something different. Research shows that there is a large portion of potential voters of the left that want very clearly left-wing social economic positions and very clearly left-wing social cultural positions. They want wokeness, to put it like in right-wing terms. For some reason, that doesn't register. And that has a lot to do with the fact that 
particularly social democrats, still think in 20th century political terms. They still go for a 30%, 40% electorate. That is over. Uh, European politics has fragmented. If the Social Democrats have 20, 25% of the vote, they have a fantastic election. Um, it is clear young people are concerned about climate change. Young people are concerned about inclusion. But young people are also very much concerned about socioeconomic things, including welfare state, whether it will stay, education, housing is a massive issue, right? All of that we know. Like, from surveys, clear positions is what people want. This is the problem of the Greens tends to be that they cater to a specific group, higher educated urban people. For them, these things resonate and work. The Social Democrats try to stay in the middle, socioculturally and socioeconomically, and most people want either a strongly right-wing or a strongly left-wing position. Um, and so I do believe that there is space for a left-wing agenda. Is that going to be the majority? Probably not. At least not for a while. Um, the impact of European defense. Now that comes very close to my heart. A while back I wrote a column for The Guardian exactly about that issue. I think it's high time that we have a fundamental conversation about the need to build the European defense in which we're very clear about the cost. And the costs are big. Uh, it, I, simplistically, you can spend a dollar only once. That's actually not true. You can create more dollars. But the European defense is going to be massive. It means you're not going to spend it on something else. At the moment, the elite, both in this country and in Europe, are are thinking that there is a, what we used to call permissive consensus in the EU literature. It's kind of idea that people don't know much about it, but they're supportive. That's what Ukraine is. With the exception of a couple of countries, Europeans know very little about Ukraine. They don't have any specific affinity. They don't like Putin. In the West, very few people think that Putin is going to invade them. Like Poles might, Baltic people for sure, but Dutch people not, French people not. <clears throat> At the moment they support anything because they don't see cost. But if you would ask them, not do you think we should give money to Ukraine, but should we prioritize that over and then give a list, it would come very low. And so it is crucial, and that's why the European elections were the perfect, the perfect opportunity to explain long-term Ukraine policy and to explain long-term defense policy and to actually create that democratic uh, support base where you tell people, we do this for this reason, but it will cost money. But we're going at it in the way that we went into the Euro. It's a lofty goal, sounds awesome, but no one knows that it actually costs money. And by the time that we're going to realize that it costs money, you will see how weak that support was. And I really worry about that. Not so much about Ukraine, it's a different issue. Without the US, that's over anyway. Europe is not going to build them out. But European defense is fundamental. Right? And as I said, very expensive. There is no basis for that. And, and the EPP, one thing to their credit, at least they tried to talk about it. Again, the left has no position on it. Like, and of course, the, for the Greens, it's painful. It's difficult to struggle with. But Social Democrats don't have a position on it either. Um, what should the right wing do? Um, so it's interesting. For social democrats, copying the far right almost always means losing. That's not the case for the mainstream right. For the mainstream right, it probably means short-term success, long-term failure. And we see that, actually. Uh, parties that have been doing well 
by copying the far right, OVAL being a very good example, Fevi Day to a certain extent in the Netherlands. They're at a certain point in time, which is partly the mainstreaming of the far right, like, people are going to think, you know, I actually don't need that middleman anymore. I can just go for the far right because they will lead. And they actually believe it. Um, but the point is you lose your support over decades. You're going to not win it back by one smart campaign. You're going to win it back over decades. Um, Right-wing parties, particularly Christian Democrats, but to some extent conservatives too, are like so social Democrats. They have dying electorates. They have dying electorates and dying memberships. Um, and they're caught in this catch-22. Uh, you either cater to the ones that you have, where you know that you get less and less, but at least you get that. Or you cater to a new group, potentially you lose part of your existing electorate, and you never know whether they will come out. The young people don't vote. Right? And so there is, there is an agenda. I think for the right, the agenda is socioeconomic. Um, there is a reasonable part of the electorate that is anti-immigrant, that is even more anti-taxes. Right? That is what sets them apart from Rassemblement National or from PVV. Um, for Christian democratic parties, they can actually be Christian democratic again, which is a real ideology, which has a whole vision on the environment, for example. There's a whole vision on society, on the economy. Um, there is a market for it. Is it as big as it used to be? No. Right? But nothing is. And so I... I Personally, I think that we need like the old ideologies, and if you have a new one, go for it, but the old ideologies haven't failed. They have been become outdated, and they have become ignored. Like, and that means that if you're a social democrat like me, you don't go back to what you said in the 60s, 70s. You can't. The welfare state is going to be, is still a, a fantastic idea an institution, but it has to be shaped differently in a multicultural society with gender equality, like <clears throat> where you where you have LGBTQI people who you actually accept. So the, the heteronormative patriarchal structure on which most welfare states are based like, is no longer acceptable. But the core values of solidarity like, and others are still relevant. And so we need to go back to ideological politics because we can make cliches of the far right and say that it's all about protest or charismatic leaders. But one of the core things that the far right has is empowerment. They have a clear story where they pretend to be able to do things. And they're pretty much the only one who have that. And a lot of people know that the chances that they will pull it off are small, but at least it gives some type of hope. I'm Del Tolko, a generous uh, organist that I can take one more question. And can I also use this moderator uh, privilege to ask you about one of the points you made, and then I will ask the question um, from the audience. You mentioned that social democrats almost always lose when they try to mimic far right. That's also the exactly the uh, conclusion I come to in the book. What does it mean for Biden, though, in the Democrat, Democrats' effort to work on immigration? Does it mean that they should drop that in the context of the U.S. politics? One more question. Uh, hi, I'm Sasha. I'm an intern at a lobbying firm in DC. Um, I, it might be too early to comment on this, but I was wondering if you had any thoughts on the implications of the European elections on either Georgia's elections or on Georgia, Georgia's path to becoming a member of the EU. And apologies to all others who couldn't ask the questions. Living in Georgia, I understand that you mean the other Georgia. Um, <laughs> I was like, how would that affect the election? <laughs> um, to be honest, I think the Caucasus is uh, together with Ukraine at best. Uh, and they are in the same category as Turkey, in the sense that we, we talk about them, but I don't see how Ukraine membership of the EU is realistic within the first couple of decades. Um, 
<clears throat> so the Western Balkans is a different story. I think highly problematic from all kinds of perspectives, but again, Ukraine is the most important thing at the moment, and they're very concerned that Russia will get too much influence in that region. Um, and so they, they, they will sneak it in, in some way or another, but Georgia, Moldova, Ukraine, I, I think that and that would also lead to a massive, Georgia not, but like Ukraine would lead to a massive backlash, I think. Um, Biden immigration, absolutely dramatic. I mean, beyond stupid what he's doing, but it has to do with Biden, who he is, and what his, his strategy has always been. And his strategy has always been that he thinks that there is a swing vote. And there is a swing and U.S. elections are so close, uh, because U.S. elections are about four states, roughly. And in those four states, the differences are a couple thousand. And so, yes, it can be the weather, right? It, it can be absolutely everything. But his strategy is, I'm going to swing those people, rather than, I'm going to get a little bit more turnout. Because the vast majority of the people who don't vote will vote Democrat rather than Republican. So that's where it's at, right? It's not where he goes. So he does exactly what the EPP does. Right? And this is actually what they're literally saying at the moment. Uh, they're, they're now taunting the Republicans for being not really anti-immigrant. But that they are the ones that came with a real closed border proposal. Right? It won't swing anyone. Anyone who is for whom anti-immigration is the key motivation to vote does not consider voting for the far right. For anyone whom it is a secondary point, then it's the first point they want to hear. And the first point is economy. Right? And so I think personally the anti the, the extremism threat campaign is also highly problematic. Because it's the wrong message, and he's the wrong messenger. He hasn't done anything to protect U.S. democracy from Republicans for four years. Why should we believe that this is really what he cares about? He still talks about mega-Republicans and Republicans, as if there is some conservative, liberal, democratic, Republican party that is being held hostage by a small group of far-right Trumpians. It isn't. The base of the Republican Party is Trumpian. Was Trumpian pre-Trump, right? And so that's not where it is. For him, it's very clear. The economy is stellar, right? Go for that. And most importantly, talk about the economy being aware of how racialized this force is in this country. One of the things that Joe from Scranton always has is that he plays this working class man. But that is exactly the working class man that everyone associates with white. He might not do that, but both white people and non-white people think talking about white people. Right? And when he then speaks for African Americans or Hispanics, for African Americans, he will talk, talk about racism. To Hispanics, he will talk about immigration. But African American and Hispanic Americans are also concerned about the economy. Right? And you don't have to tell African Americans in the US that racism is a big problem or that the Republican Party is racist. Right? They know that. They probably large point think you are too or you're not doing enough. What they want to hear is how is your economic policy also helping me? And I worry. I really worry because we're not that far from the election. He is going back and forth towards immigration and extremism. And, and the economy is, I mean, there is now this idea that people will start to understand that the economy is good by that time. I don't know. It's a big, it's a big if. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Mada. One is to hope that uh, maybe mainstream right-wing and left-wing politicians are listening to you and maybe they'll learn some lessons. Also, 
Also, it seems like this whole new book on conservatism in the making, potentially also the bestseller, is the one on populism. So we're looking forward to potential reading in the future. Thank you so much for fascinating conversation. Thank you very much for the audience, too, for fantastic questions and for the Liberal Studies program for hosting us. And looking forward to another conversation, maybe after November elections, we'll see what predictions come true and which ones not. Thank you.